I am going to present you the project we have been working on with Mark Howard and Shane Mansfield, uh, which links quantum advantage, Wigner negativity, and sequential contextuality in a setting that can be pictured as a generalized random access code. Firstly, let's discuss information retrieval tasks. A classical example is random access code. Uh, in this communication scenario, two parties are cooperating. Uh, Alice receives n inputs, which can be bits or more generally dits, uh, and she encodes them into a message of length m. Of course, this message is shorter than the whole, than the whole input string, otherwise all information could be transmitted to Bob. And then Bob is asked by a referee to retrieve one of the inputs, uh, and based on the message he receives, he tries to guess the correct input. And they win, of course, if Bob outputs the correct input. A common example uh, of this uh, game is a 2 1 2 rack, where the last subscript 2 uh, stands for the dimension of the game, so here we work with bits or qubits. The first 2 specifies the number of inputs, uh, so here says that Alice receives 2 bits, x and z, uh, and the 1 specifies the length of the message, therefore she can send either a single bit or a single qubit, depending if we play the game classically or quantumly. So if you think about it, uh, classically, the best strategy for Alice is to send one of, the, of her inputs. Um, then if Bob is asked to retrieve this input, they win the game deterministically. And otherwise, he just uh, randomly guesses uh, the other input, and thus they have probability 0.5 to win the game. Uh, thus the overall classical probability is 0.75. And quantumly, uh, the best strategy is depicted here. So this is a ZX plane in the block sphere, and Alice sends uh, one of the four qubit state, uh, the red dot, uh, depending on her inputs. And then Bob measures in the X basi basis whenever he wants to uh, decode the bit X, and the Z basis uh, if he's asked to retrieve the Z uh, bit. Uh, and the overall uh, quantum probability of winning is then a point 85 approximately, which is strictly larger than uh, the classical uh, winning probability. And thus we witness that we have a quantum advantage if we are allowed to send a qubit rather than a dit. Uh, more generally uh, than random access code, um, we can define information retrieval tasks uh, in a communication scenario where uh, the number of inputs is given, it's n, the length of the message is also specified, m, and uh, also the dimension is fixed, uh, d. Um, and then we define an information retrieval task by specifying a tuple. Uh, q is a finite set of questions, and wq is uh, the winning relations. Uh, so for example, if you want to retrieve q rack from this more general definition, then q would be a, a set from 1 to n, uh, which specifies which uh, bit or dit you want to retrieve, and then WQ would be uh, just a projector onto this uh, input dit or bit. But however, the set of questions could be broader. For instance, uh, we could ask about uh, relative information about the inputs, such as, for instance, the pa their parity, uh, and we could even ask for a relation rather than uh, a function uh, over inputs. Another key point to our project is a strong link between random access code and mutually unbiased basis. This connection has already been noted uh, and in fact is being used for the best quantum strategies of random access code with two or three inputs. Uh, in both cases, you use MUBs as measurements. However, we can already note that in prime power dimension D, uh, there are D plus one MUBs, uh, and for instance, for the three input case, uh, only three maps are being used and not four, so maybe there is room for an extra equation. In another paper from Casacino, uh, maps were already used uh, to construct uh, a QDID version of uh, quantum random access code. Uh, and in fact, maps have a neat geometric interpretation in Affan plane. So, for instance, in dimension three, it's just like a toric 3x3 plane where the top is glued to the bottom and the right to the left. Uh, and the four maps are actually the four types of lines that you can draw here. 
So for instance, you have line, columns, and you have two types of diagonal. Um, and for each type of line, you actually have three lines, right? So here you have three columns, you also have three different lines. And this corresponds exactly to the number of outputs in one mob in Dimension 3. Let's dive into the torpedo game. The torpedo game is an information retrieval task in which Alice is given two input dits X and Z by a referee. She then sends a single message, uh, which can be a dit or a Q dit to Bob. And Bob is asked one out of D plus one equations that are labeled infinity, zero, one, etc., etc. That's the reason will hopefully become clear shortly. The last missing ingredient to specify fully uh, an information retrieval task are the winning relations that I will give shortly. But first, we can ask why the name, why the topic of the game? Well, you can picture this game as, uh, as the following. So Alice and Bob are all disco dancing buddies who find themselves on opposite sides in the naval battle. But they wish to subvert the conflict and avoid casualties or pacifists. Um, and let's fix, let's fix the dimension to three, four for now. So uh, imagine the following. So Alice commander gives her a position uh, of the boat in this grid, so in, a, in this three by three grid. So it's a position XZ. Then Alice communicates to Bob only one Q treat or treat to avoid giving away our exact position if the message is intercepted. Then Bob is outside of the grid in a boat and his commander gives him a direction, a direction to shoot in. So he can say, for instance, shoot along a line or shoot along a column. Uh, and then Bob has the freedom to choose which line or which column, which line he shoots in. Uh, and so Bob tries to pick a line to avoid uh, eating Alice. Uh, and so that's why you have these winning relations defined with, not, defined with nuts rather than a definite did value. Uh, it's because you want to avoid Alice. You, you want to avoid eating her. Uh, and so they win the game if Alice is paired. So if he managed to answer the, the line, uh, Alice is not in. Uh, and these are the winning relations for dimension three, but of course it can be generalized. Um, actually, the questions that Bob is asked can be pictured by specifying the slope and the label. So infinity to corresponds to this line, then zero to these columns, and then you have a, a given slope for diagonals. Uh, so here are the four questions Bob can be asked uh, in dimension three. So note that this corresponds to, to the maps in dimension three. Um, and below, uh, all the, below in the blue cells, are the lines or the answers uh, Bob can give. So if he's asked to shoot along a, a column, for instance, he, so equation uh, zero, he has three possible lines to shoot in. What are the best classical strategies for the top of the game? Alice and Bob can have a pre-shot strategy um, and the best they can do is actually to uh, have a pre-shot partition grid um, and so Alice would send the partition she lies in to Bob and of course it amounts to coloring a grid with at most D colors um, and, Bob, and Alice would send to Bob a color. Uh, that's why you can uh, picture these classical strategies as disco dance floor. So for instance in dimension 3 uh, here is a disco dance floor we found optimal by exhaustive search. Um, so if Bob is asked the last questions, uh, you see that he has definite answer to avoid Alice. But if he's asked one of the three other questions, then for instance here, if Alice sends she's in the red partition, he knows where to shoot to avoid Alice. Same for blue, but for the green, it's uh, uh, unbiased. So he has priority two thirds of avoiding her. So that's why it gives you a total priority of 11 over 12. Uh, and likewise, you can compute the best classical priority in dimension two, and you find that it's uh, three over four. Uh, and for dimension three, five and above, uh, we found a perfect grid up until dimension 23. So that's why we won't look at dimension above five because, uh, well, we can't have a quantum advantage here. What are the quantum strategies for the torpedo game? Um, the key fact lies in this relation. So Psi XZ is a state that Alice will send to Bob, and these pi's are the projectors that Bob will select. So infinity 0, 1, 2, the subscript, specifies in each map as you are. Uh, so in, for instance, infinity uh, corresponds to the commander asking Bob to shoot along a line. And this superscript, 
uh, what it stands for? Well, in each map you have three different projectors in dimension three, so this X specify uh, which projector you take. A key point is that you can construct phase point operator AXZ using sums of projectors from up using this relation. And this tells you how to take this psi xz, so there are minus one again vectors of this phase point operator. Uh, and if you do that, then uh, in each mob, you have one specific outcome which is forbidden. So for, in for instance, in the mob zero, uh, which specifies a column, uh, minus z, the outcome minus z is forbidden. And another key and neat relation uh, to phase point operator is a uh, discrete Wigner function. So you can discrete, uh, construct discrete Wigner functions, which is a collection of this WXZ um, guy relations to phase point operator at point XZ. And below is represented um, uh, a Wigner function, the Wigner function of the state uh, row one zero, which directly corresponds to this psi XZ. And you see that it's maximally negative at point one zero. So the strategy goes as following. Whenever Alice is in cells XZ, she will send the state row of XZ to Bob, which is maximally negative at uh, cell XZ. And this state has the following property. So whenever Bob is asked to shoot along one direction, then you know that the specific outcome is forbidden and the specific outcomes is really where Alice is. So Bob is sure to avoid giving the line Alice is. What is the overall advantage? To make a fair comparison, uh, we have to take a four uh, equation game because uh, our torpedo game with Q-treats are four equations. And the only Q-rack with four equations is a four input Q-rack. For this, as a quantum of a classical advantage is uh, 0 1.075 whereas our torpedo game has a, a bit uh, larger uh, gap, which is 1.091. Where does the advantage come from is the next question, right? Um, so we know that these states that Ali sends is psi xz are maximally negative in discrete Wigner function. And also, uh, negative discrete Wigner function is equivalent to caution specker contextuality by Howard. Um, so here is a classic picture um, uh, where in this polytop uh, you have the states that are uh, simulatable classically and outside in the green area uh, are states that are caution specker contextual and necessary for universal quantum computation. These are the states that feature negative discrete Wigner function. So we can ask now, does contextuality provide an explanation here? We now see that we can explain the source of quantum advantage in the torpedo game by means of sequential contextuality. First, we have to express our general torpedo game in a sequential protocol. In this sequential protocol, you have a fixed preparation followed by two control rotations. So these uh, rotations are controlled by the input dates. And the measurement is a fixed measurement preceded by a transformation controlled by the, by the equation label. And this is strictly equivalent to the general torpedo game. The next question is, can we explain uh, what happens in the torpedo game uh, with a memory restricted hidden variable model? Why memory restricted? It's because this message we have in the middle uh, cannot be of full dimension. Uh, it is necessarily uh, smaller than the number of inputs. And so, in a way, you have to restrict your memory here. Uh, that's why you have to explain classically what happens with a memory-restricted hidden variable model. So, empirically, what happens uh, is that you have uh, E, which is a, a collection of probability distribution, um, one probability distribution for each input string in equation over the output set ZD, so a context in this setting uh, is labeled by an input string and equation. And so we model uh, uh, our HVM by what? By a preparation, which is a probability vector in R3, followed by three rotations, which will be modeled by left stochastic matrices. Uh, why left stochastic matrices? It's because 
uh, we want to preserve property distributions um, via, measure, via transformations. And the measurement is just a projection onto basis vectors. And we want, we want to see, can we explain the empirical behaviors by this hidden uh, variable model, which has a memory restricted uh, hypothesis. What do we mean by sequential non-contextuality? We'll say that a hidden variable model is sequentially non-contextual if it preserves two points. First, you want that in all sequences, whenever you have a transformation that occur, you want this to have the same uh, representation in the hidden at the hidden variable level. Uh, and also, uh, you want your mo model to preserve sequential composition. So whenever you have a, a composition of uh, transformations that occur in uh, different contexts, you want this to be respected at the level of uh, hidden variable models. And you will say that your empirical behavior is sequentially contextual if it's not realizable by any sequential non-contextual hidden variable model. Um, what's nice is that you can quantify this contextuality with a linear programming. So um, given an empirical model, you will try to decompose it to do a convex decomposition with a, a non-contextual uh, empirical model and something else. And you will try to optimize to put uh, more, the more weight possible on the non-contextual parts and what's left over is necessarily uh, contextual. So you will maximize over the weight omega, over the weight of your non-contextual parts. And what will be left here is your contextuality. And you can quantify contextuality that way. Now we are ready to state uh, the results we have in the torpedo game. So first, if, we want, if you want to win the torpedo game in dimension 2 and 3 deterministically, then you need to be strong sequentially contextual. So you need to have a contextual fraction of 1. And also, um, in the torpedo game, or more generally in any information retrieval tasks, well, which you can express in, uh, in a sequential communication scenario, um, you will have this inequality. So this inequality link epsilon, which is the probability of failure uh, of your game, the non-contextual fraction, and uh, new which measures the hardness of the task so you see here that it's one minus the best classical uh, probability um, and so for instance uh, if you want uh, your probability of failure to be above this threshold of new then you can be classical you can have a, a contextual fraction uh, of zero but whenever you want to fall under this value then you necessarily need to have some kind of contextuality to conclude, um, we've developed a framework for information retrieval tasks in communication scenarios. Um, random access coding is an example, but we've introduced another game, uh, which is a torpedo game, uh, a pacifist alternative to a uh, battleship. Uh, we've seen that uh, we have a quantum advantage for dimension two and three in our game, and this uh, quantum advantage exploits uh, maximal Wigner negativity. Um, and also the last point is that uh, sequential contextuality quantifies this uh, quantum advantage. Thank you for your attention.